All right, so now we're joined by Judge Janet Helson, who's running for Superior Court position in South Bend. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here. This is such an important process, particularly when it comes to judges and judicial races, because it's so hard for people to get information about judges, and uh, they count on you to give them that information. Um, so I am actually here on my third day um, of being a judge. I was appointed by Governor Inslee on March 13th, and I finished my last trial as an attorney um, Friday at noon, and I was sworn in Monday morning. So I'm on day three. And uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so climbing the very steep learning curve rapidly, but so far really enjoying it. I um, came to um, apply for a judgeship at this point in time because I really feel like I'm at the point in my career and in terms of life experience and legal experience that I'm to a place where I can contribute in a meaningful way to the work of the bench. There are a couple of things that made me particularly want to join now. I've spent most of my career, in fact all of my career, other than two clerkships for federal judges, um, working on family law issues, and for the first 12 years I was at Evergreen and Columbia Legal Services focused on um, serving, representing um, survivors of domestic violence in my own practice and protective parents and parents attempting to recover abducted children. I also was the director of the Columbia office and so supervised and worked with attorneys starting all kinds of projects to increase access to justice for low income folks on housing issues and benefits issues and senior issues. I've spent the last 10 years at a small law firm that has a long history of civil rights work and a part of my practice there has been to focus on um, rights for LGBT parents and families. Um, my wife and I were actually plaintiffs in Anderson v. King County, the marriage case um, that was unsuccessful, but we like to think um, catalyzed the process that led to the domestic partner law and ultimately to R74. So um, the family law has a deep need. Uh, the Superior Court has a sort of deep need in the area of family law. It's a big portion of the cases there, and a number of the judges with family law experience have retired recently. So that's why I chose now to step up. Thank you. Great, thank you. So now we have four prepared questions, uh, two-minute answers to each of these, and they're actually on that piece of paper right in front of you if you want to turn it over and read along as we read them aloud. Um, David, do you want to do number one? I'd be delighted. Uh, uh, how would you describe your judicial philosophy? <laughs> um, I, um, I think the courts exist to do justice. And while judges are constrained by the laws the legislature passes, um, sitting as a judge in King County Superior Court, as a judge with equity powers, there are a number of occasions and opportunities where you're not constrained by uh, the legislature hasn't particularly spoken or a particular answer hasn't, question hasn't been answered. And in my mind, the point of <coughs> our courts and our justice system is to do justice in sort of the largest sense of the word. Um, and that doesn't mean that I've sort of prejudged what is just in a particular situation. As a judge, I think you have to listen very carefully to the issues that are presented to you, to particular issues and the facts that are presented. But underlying all of that, what, what should infuse our system is a notion of doing justice for people. And as part of that, creating access to justice, meaningful access to justice for everyone, to our courts. And and, and paying attention to sort of disproportionality issues and historic issues of people who haven't always had a path to the courthouse and who face certain barriers in accessing the courthouse. That has been a big part of my practice when I was at legal services and even when I was in private practice. And it remains something that I um, will bring to the bench as part of my judicial philosophy. Um, and so I think it's about carefully and thoughtfully applying the law and considering whether there are opportunities, um, always looking to do justice and um, when necessary, looking for new ways to do justice that haven't been there before and, 
An example in my practice was a case I was involved in called LB that established the de facto parent doctrine in Washington state to protect relationships of children with parents with whom they didn't have legal relationships. It was particularly important for same-sex couples before um, marriage recognition and remains uh, important um, for families. Okay, Janet, number two. Do you support the current system of electing judges or do you support some other system, such as appointment or an appointment and retention election hybrid? And if elections continue, what reform of current campaign finance rules would you support? Um, I think the issue of electing judges is, is quite complex. And I certainly think, um, well, we have what is now, at least in the Superior Court, a hybrid process. Most of the judges sitting on the Superior Court are initially appointed and then run for retention. I actually think that um, makes a fair amount of sense as a way to go. I, what's challenging is I think it's often difficult for the general public to have the information they need to have their votes be meaningful. And we're all aware of elections where, frankly, people who if they knew about a particular judge and what he or she stood for, never would have voted for that person, but there just wasn't information out there. Um, and that's a real concern. And I think it becomes a bigger concern, actually, when you look at state Supreme Court races where it more typically is a, a, a full-out mm -hmm. election. It, it is an election and there isn't an appointment <clears throat> process. Uh, generally, uh, it's more commonly that there are elections, and I think very often there's a lack of information. You're dealing with a statewide race and someone who often isn't really known statewide. So I think that's the complexity there. You want to get qualified people. It's not always clear that the general public has the information they need to vote for qualified people. On the other hand, I don't think you want to have a closed process with no opportunity for public input and for voters to sort of pull someone back who's gotten out of control or is making decisions that are clearly outside of the bounds of um, sort of the rule of law or, or acceptable norms of justice. So I don't know that I've completely thought through or solved that issue. I think it's complex. It has to be a balance. Um, in terms of the campaign finance rules, frankly, I um, have not focused a lot of attention on those and don't know that um, I have particular um, particular reforms I, I would propose. I do think um, that we need to have a system where people can't simply buy their way into having an office by spending more than what anyone else can spend, and I think that's important. Um, Michael, number three. Many people appear without attorney representation in Superior Court. In what ways is it appropriate for a judge to assist someone with the process of a judicial proceeding without appearing biased? Um, well, judges have to do that all the time, and, and particularly family court commissioners, which was a calendar I appeared on with some regularity. I think there's a spectrum. I see a spectrum of how judicial officers handle that. It's very clear that you can't give someone legal advice, and you can't give them substantive suggestions. Yet that being the case, I've seen a real range of judicial officers who will just sort of say in, in somewhat opaque terms, well, uh, your motion isn't noted correctly, you're going to have to consult the rule book, which really doesn't help someone, or frankly help the court in terms of moving the process along. And I think there's a, a, another, another part of the spectrum where you can be more specific and where you can point out, um, you can note particular rules that have been violated, you can note particular resources people can look at. The court is working hard to have resources available. There's something called IRCAMS, the Early Resolution uh, Court, I can't remember the last thing, but it's for family law litigants, where at least one of them is pro se. So there's really a lot of attention being focused on how to do that better. And there's definitely a line beyond which you really can't step in terms of appearing to take sides. But I think you can also avoid standing on technicalities on a way that creates unnecessary barriers for pro se litigants. And there's definitely a range of practice that I've seen down there. And as someone who has 
spent my career trying to create access to the court and setting up programs to design to help pro se litigants and volunteering in, in programs designed to help um, pro se litigants. Uh, you know, I consider that to be a, an important part of what I want to do in terms of thinking about how to create better resources for doing that and how within the limits of what I can do um, to make things more accessible. Great. Mary, number four. Sure. Like the rest of the government, the courts have struggled with reductions in funding. Where can the courts cut costs and increase efficiency, and how will you advocate for sufficient funding for our judicial branch? Um, it's funny, I've been having conversations about this lately, as with several other issues like mental health and education, when it comes to court funding, our state is at the very bottom or near the very bottom. We are currently tied for 49th in terms of funding of our trial courts, which is, is pretty astounding given um, the wealth available in this state in certain ways. And so in terms of <coughs> where the court can cut costs, I have to say this court is pretty close to the bone and has been for a long time. As a family law practitioner, when I think about ways I would like to have us look at best practices and think about how better to assist families, and I think about all the things we're missing, and it's really, I think, a result of simply having no resources, shrinking resources, and doing it on a smaller and smaller shoestring. Um, I'm relatively new there, I'm sure if I, in three days, um, <laughs> you know, I imagine that if you talk to me in a year, I may be able to say, well, I think this particular thing could be cut a little bit, but really I think the court is doing a lot to stretch things a long way, and some of the things they're doing are innovative programs, um, some of which aren't so innovative anymore, like um, drug court, um, but they've expanded to things like mental health court and veterans court that are really designed to keep people out of being incarcerated and do what they can to keep them out of the trial and litigation system. And I think they've found those programs to be pretty successful and cost effective. And similarly, um, you know, while they're continuing to be ongoing issues about proportionality when it comes to detaining juveniles, the rate of detaining juveniles has gone substantially down. Um, so, you know, I, I really think in, in terms of how I will work for resources, I, um, in my work at Legal Services and on the State Bar Family Law Executive Committee, I did a lot of work with the state legislature, sometimes on funding issues, and I think it's really important for the judges to be out in the community talking about the need for more funding for the courts and having people really understand the human aspect of our court system. And I think it's possible, important for some judges to be down there talking to legislators about the impact it makes in a really human way when the courts don't have resources for a supervised visitation center, for example. Great. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. Clayton, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, I, um, I wanted to ask you to follow up on question three, our pro se question, um, um, with specific regard to a situation in which a corporation was trying to foreclose on the property of someone who was relatively indigent and had been ill and, and uh, so was you know, uh, not able to afford representation before your court. I wondered, I wondered if you could, you could tell us how you, how you might approach finding, finding justice when in the face of corporate claim. Well, corporations face the same burden of proof that everybody else does, and just because they have a fancy lawyer and more resources doesn't necessarily mean that they win or that the facts are on their side. I think in terms of that pro se litigant, um, I think doing what you can to make sure the person has is aware of the resources that exist out there to assist pro se's. Um, I used to volunteer at the Cross-Cultural Legal Clinic and, and remembered moments of feeling like this is just, how can we help this pro se, limited English speaking, Filipino woman, get through her divorce against the domestic violence perpetrator and she came back and met with different people 
and she won at trial, amazingly, against a lawyer. So I, I think that with the particular person you've discussed, at times if someone has an actual disability, at t it can become an ADA issue that might <coughs> rise to the level of actually appointing counsel for someone. Um, if it's simply that they're low income and can't afford an attorney, unfortunately there isn't in our system currently a right to civil legal representation, making sure they know about the Northwest Justice Project and the King County Bars Neighborhood Legal Clinics and know about the resources that might be out there available to them. And then making sure that while um, everyone has to follow the rules, the rules are as clear as they can be and you avoid having the rules um, create unnecessary barriers. Because truly it is, it, it is possible for pro se litigants to bring their information and for, forward and it's ultimately the facts and the law, not how they're packaged and who has the best lawyer that determines how a case is decided. So I've got a question. Um, so you mentioned uh, appointing an attorney for someone with a disability. I've, I've worked on representational accommodation issues before, um, and uh, it was 2007 or so that the Supreme Court um, added to GR 33, sort of appointing an attorney if it's an accommodation for someone. I'm wondering, um, I know you've only been on the court for three days, um, but if you could comment on what, what sort of criteria would you use, like what what sort of disability would someone need to appoint an attorney as a, represent, represent, a rep representative as an accommodation under the ADA? And how is King County Superior Court handling that? Um, so it's funny, I actually was in a conversation with this very issue with some court administrators today, um, and I think they're struggling with it in part because of the really difficult budgetary issues. In terms of the criteria, um, which is not a basis for denying it, but still at some level um, the court has to work with what it, what it has to work with, I think where you're likely to, it is likely to reach a level where an attorney has to be appointed would be where someone has a mental health or cognitive <coughs> impairment. If, for example, someone were deaf, normally I think you can accommodate them and get them to the level of any other pro se litigant by providing necessary interpreter services or assistive hear hearing device or if someone were blind, you can accommodate them by providing a reader, a note taker, who wouldn't necessarily have to be a lawyer because I don't think you're, the court's duty under the ADA is to take someone and I, I, I think where you have to put them is sort of where they would be as a pro se with the same access as any other pro se. When someone has a cognitive or mental health issue, that might be where the only way to achieve that for someone is to actually appoint an attorney who either provides full-on representation or provides a level of explanation that allows them to represent themselves effectively. Great, thank you. Time for a couple more yeah, Jen. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned that many family law judges have been retiring in recent years, some of whom were pretty amazing judges. Um, what remaining or what major reforms do you see as unresolved in family law and particularly in child welfare? Um, well, I think there are a lot of issues out there, frankly, that remain unresolved. One I've been discussing with folks recently is LGBTQ youth. They make up probably 40% of the kids who are on the streets and they make up a pretty high percentage of kids who end up in foster homes because their families um, aren't welcoming to them. And I frankly think, uh, my, my now wife and I were foster parents many years ago for teenagers, um, and it was clear to us as we went through the foster parent training that a number of the other foster parents were not people who were going to be inviting to those kids and would be no better than the homes from which they left. And I'm still not sure that the and that's not so much a judge issue, um, although I think there's room for judges to be involved in ensuring that there are appropriate placements for kids like that. So that's one of the issues I see. I think, um, and, and for teenagers kind of across the board, I think there's a failure to actually meet their needs in a meaningful way in the dependency and, and juvenile system. I think often when you look at issues like truancy, 
there's um, a failure to provide the planning and provide the services before more extreme measures are con considered. So I think there's a whole constellation, I'm speaking more to juvenile than family law now, but there are a number of issues that also could be addressed in the family law arena, but I see that I'm out of time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we're about out of time, if you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, I am really happy and honored to have been appointed to this court. I um, anticipate that I will spend a year or two with my eyes and ears open, learning a lot and figuring out how to be the best judge I can possibly be. And then I really hope to be looking around and much as I did when I was at legal services or when I was on the Family Law Executive Committee, be looking for ways um, that our court can be better as a whole, where we can address access to justice issues, where we can look at family law best practices and juvenile best practices, and, and try to bring our court, despite the lack of resources, um, closer to that ideal. And I think there are lots of things our court is doing right and is doing creatively and well, but I think there are, there are plenty of ways um, for improvements to be made, and, and we owe it to our community and to our kids and to our populations that are particularly challenged and interacting with the justice system to make sure that we're working to have the best courts we can have. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure.